Welcome everyone to our webinar here today on the ebook ecology um, updates from Spain and Germany, as well as from our colleagues at the Authors Alliance in the US. Um, my name is Stephen Weiber. I am a Director of Policy and Advocacy at IFLA and the Chair of the Management Committee at Knowledge Rights 21. Um, for those of you who don't know Knowledge Rights 21 before, who are joining us for the first time, we are a campaign that looks to make sure that the voices, the needs of researchers, of readers, of educators, of learners are properly heard in legislative discussions. And I think for us, um, this question of ebooks is really, it's a, it's, it's a bellwether. It's a, a, an issue, a really sort of defining issue of is, are the rules, are the laws that are affecting, that are shaping the way in which information is accessed, it's used, it's shared, are they actually working to deliver access to knowledge, to culture, to education, to research in the 21st century? Are we fulfilling all the potential of digital technologies? So just to start, as my colleague um, Ben White mentioned earlier, um, in addition to us recording this meeting, first of all, we encourage you to uh, include where you're writing, where you're joining us from in the chat, and we do use the chat. The other thing we really would like you to use in the chat, use the chat for is to ask any questions that, that you have. Um, we'll get to those, we'll make sure that there's enough time. We've got 90 minutes for the webinar, so there's there's, there's, there's plenty of time to, to get into questions at the end. Um, and then simply to listen in and enjoy. Um, I think what I'm going to do is, is as I said, this is an area where as Knowledge Rights 21, we see this as, as a determining thing. We certainly see the interest, see the value in a more active approach in law um, in order to make sure that all the content that is available through ebooks, not just within the public library space to access culture, but in the large parts of academia, this is a really crucial area, um, that there is a case for a more active legislative approach at the European level, at the national level. Um, the joy of this webinar today is that we're going to hear probably a bit about both. Um, so without further ado, I think I, I'm keen to actually hand over to our hand over to, to, to our speakers to give some focus. So first on the agenda, I'd like to hand over to Dave Hansen from the Authors Alliance. Um, I'm going to let Dave sort of talk a little about, a bit about the Authors Alliance, but then give us that update. I don't know, what's the, the some, I know, as I said, this is a bleeding edge issue. What's the bleeding edge today? What, what's the situation we're in? What are the challenges we're facing? What are the opportunities there are? What's at the top of your mind when thinking about how to make sure that ebook markets, laws, laws around access to ebooks, possibilities to use ebooks are actually working for everyone concerned? Dave, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, and uh, thank you for everybody um, who's uh, joined. Um, and I, I see everybody putting in where they're from in the uh, chat. It's great to see uh, such an involvement from uh, so many different places. Um, so I have a few slides. Uh, let me get my screen up here. Um, as uh, as Stephen said, I am um, sorry. Uh, I'm Dave Hansen from the Authors Alliance. Authors Alliance is a uh, nonprofit charity um, based in the U.S. We formed about ten years ago, and uh, our mission is um, to advance the interests of authors who want to serve the public good by sharing their creations broadly. Um, and uh, Authors Alliance actually formed out of a, uh, a pretty significant um, set of litigation in the United States around digitization of books um, and access to books um, in, in certain forms through libraries. And uh, there, there's a large digital library collective called Hadi Trust that played a pivotal role um, in our formation because there were groups of uh, other authors groups that um, brought suit against these libraries for their digitization of books to allow for research purposes and text and data mining uses. Um, and they claimed basically to represent all authors uh, in that suit. And there were a large group of other authors who stood up and said, well, wait a minute, we believe that uh, those kinds of uses that libraries are making are actually very beneficial for libraries, or sorry, very, very beneficial for authors um, because they uh, promote access to our works. Um, they help people discover our work so that they will then perhaps go buy them in the future. Uh, they enable new technological um, applications such as text data mining. Um, and so those authors got together 
um, and contested uh, what was happening in that suit um, and then formed Authors Alliance. Um, so over the last year and a half, uh, we've actually been focusing on developing more support for European authors. Um, we have about uh, 2,700 members and a growing number of European authors, several hundred now, um, have uh, joined us uh, in our efforts to promote, um, promote the public interest on behalf of authors. So uh, one of the things that we do is we really try to highlight the work of authors. This is some of the, the book talks that we've done recently. Um, just to give you a sense of some of the things that uh, are close to uh, our hearts, the things that we really um, emphasize in public policy debates. And that's really where we do most of our work, public uh, policy, uh, law, and uh, focused on law and information policy. Um, so you can kind of see across these books a certain theme of um, copyright, uh, progress, um, open access uh, are kind of common issues for us to focus on. And, um, and when it comes to ebooks uh, and the rights of libraries, this has become an increasingly complicated issue across borders. Um, so, uh, so these are some of the issues that we um, really focus in on, but access through libraries is uh, sort of top of the list for us. Libraries are um, incredibly important for authors for a number of reasons. Um, authors care about libraries being able to preserve their works for the future. Um, and this is one of those things that libraries have done for centuries. Um, but when we start to look at the ebook market, we have a very different framework for how libraries can engage in that kind of preservation. Um, perhaps more importantly and more fundamentally, libraries are critical for promoting learning um, which is one of the main reasons why authors write. I think uh, so often in policy debates, we hear about authors uh, and, and authors groups kind of pushing for um, licensing dollars um, and funds. And, you know, of course, everybody has to pay their rent. Everybody um, needs uh, that uh, kind of income stream. But there are lots of other factors that go into why authors write. Um, and uh, we really, really do care about um, individuals learning from our works. Um, and then, you know, authors also need access themselves. I think that there's this idea of authors as sort of sitting in a room by themselves and thinking deep thoughts and then um, generating a book. Um, and that kind of romantic ideal of an author is, is really a fiction. Um, no author is sitting uh, and creating from nothing. Authors build upon the works of others. Even when you're talking about works of creative fiction, um, they are built upon the works of others. And so authors need access to other authors' works. Um, this is especially true when we're talking about nonfiction works, uh, when we're talking about historical works, biographies. It's critical that authors have access through libraries to a wide variety of materials in order to do their research. Um, and then, you know, maybe this goes without saying, but libraries are also a major part of uh, the market that authors benefit from. Uh, libraries spend millions and millions every year buying books. Um, and so this has become, uh, you know, a major part of the income stream to authors and especially across um, European jurisdictions with public lending rights, you know, that further bolsters the, um, the funding stream that supports authors. Uh, and, and so um, it's really important that libraries have the tools that they need to be able to fulfill um, the, the uh, readers, the users who are coming in so that they continue to buy books from publishers that support, uh, in turn support authors. Um, so uh, part of what I wanted to talk about was um, the divergence of um, how the copyright system uh, in, in the print um, book environment has uh, supported authors, whereas in the ebook, um, licensed ebook environment, it has really failed, uh, at least to date, um, to serve the needs of authors across these um, different interests. Um, and this looks very different in different jurisdictions. Uh, so one thing um, you may have heard of in the United States is uh, this pretty big lawsuit by um, some of the biggest publishers in the world, Hachette, 
Harper Collins, John Wiley and Son, and Penguin Random House against Internet Archive, which is a nonprofit library located in San Francisco that has really spearheaded uh, the idea of um, controlled digital lending in the United States. Uh, and this relies on an exception to copyright in the US known as fair use. Um, it's a very, if you've ever heard of fair use, probably the second thing that you've heard is that it's complicated and a messy analysis. Um, and, and that's true in this case. Um, we uh, filed a brief in support of Internet Archive because uh, we believe that their approach to control digital lending, um, which is essentially a system to mimic the print lending environment that libraries uh, experience in the US um, it, into a digital uh, form, we think that that's totally reasonable. Uh, you know, those books have been paid for um, by libraries. Uh, they're sitting on shelves. The way controlled digital lending works is it, it sort of locks down the physical copy while the digital copy is being accessed. So it's not getting um, two for the price of one. Um, and so we think that that's very reasonable. Um, that is a very US centric approach though. And this is an issue that crosses jurisdictions. And so I think, you know, in the EU, um, there are very different uh, solutions to some of these um, challenges. Uh, there's an emerging kind of concept of secure digital lending uh, based on some case law from the uh, European Court of Justice and um, look, based on um, some of the public lending rights that, uh, that authors enjoy. And so our feeling is that that, again, is a totally reasonable approach that balances the needs of authors to have an income stream and libraries to effectively preserve and lend books out to the public. Um, and so, so that's something that we're a strong supporter of. Um, we, uh, one of the reasons why that these, um, uh, th th this issue of libraries having ownership and control for digital copies uh, really came to the fore um, a couple of years ago. I think many of you may remember this, uh, where Wiley um, actually went in and under um, their licenses with libraries, um, uh, had a plan to remove over 1300 ebooks from library collections. Um, and I thought this is a good illustration of some of the challenges that authors face in this space when um, libraries don't have sufficient rights to do things like what Internet Archive is doing and what libraries in the EU um, and, and in the UK uh, are attempting to do under concepts like controlled digital lending and secure digital lending. Um, it, so in this case, you know, all of these were licensed ebooks. Um, and Wiley was able to kind of unilaterally make a decision to just remove these books from library electronic collections. Um, and uh, there was a, a really strong effort um, uh, spearheaded by the, the folks associated with eBooks SOS um, to push back on this. Uh, but one of the pieces that was really left out um, was authors. Um, so we started looking into this and uh, realized that across these books that were removed, none of the authors had ever been contacted by Wiley to ask their opinion about whether the book should be removed from library collections or not. Um, none of them were ever consulted about the effort that Wiley was making to take these books from those collections and from what it seemed, um, sell them kind of title by title at a highly inflated rate. Um, and none of them certainly were consulted about the timing of this, which was uh, the thing that really irked me. They did this just before the academic year started and it left so many students and, and instructors um, in a tough position. And so um, this is a really good example of kind of the lack of power uh, that authors have in this context. None of their contracts allowed them to do anything about um, what was happening with their books here. So, um, so then that gets to the licensing question of, well, what can, uh, what can authors and libraries do to promote a healthier licensing ecosystem? Um, and we think that secure digital lending is a really great solution um, for lots of titles, particularly titles that are in print already um, and are being digitized. But uh, there are lots of other options out there for um, kind of fixing this. Uh, so we were really proud to work with uh, Knowledge Rights 21 on the library ebook pledge, um, which I think we may hear a little bit more about, but this is an effort to kind of create a framework for uh, a reasonable licensing um, 
uh, uh, pathway for um, publishers who assert that they care about the interests of libraries and authors. Um, we often hear that rhetoric, but giving them kind of a pathway to exercise that I think was um, really important. Um, this, again, I'll note kind of the cross-jurisdictional approaches to this in the U.S. Um, we've seen some really interesting efforts, uh, not at the federal level, but at individual state levels to um, create legislation that would empower libraries to have fairer contracting terms so that they could effectively preserve the, right, uh, the books of uh, authors, so that they could lend them on terms that are very similar to what they've done in print over the years. Um, and those are very interesting efforts to me. Um, and I see a lot of parallels to those um, in some efforts in the EU that I think we're gonna hear about in a little bit. And so um, it's, a, it, it's an emerging space and I think um, kind of encouraging to me to see that um, basically across the world, um, people are kind of waking up to this issue that libraries are a really critical institution from a uh, from the perspective of you know promoting democracy and promoting learning and promoting knowledge, and they can't be left to sort of fend for themselves all the time in a marketplace that is increasingly consolidated by very large uh, oligopolies that um, have no incentive to really negotiate on terms that value the, the public interest. Um, so, so that's all I have to say. If you take away nothing else, it is that there are a large group of authors who care deeply about libraries being able to lend their books. Um, and uh, don't believe it when you hear from some of the publishers or from some of the uh, rights collective groups when they say that libraries lending books is going to you know, destroy their livelihood. There are lots and lots of challenges that authors face um, when it comes to earning a living, uh, pirate websites, um, you know, are, I think are kind of top of the list. Publishers and the lack of competition are top of the list. Librarians lending their books on the internet is nowhere near the top 10. And in fact, it's probably more of a net positive for most authors than it is uh, a negative. So, so that's all I have to say. Um, I also did wanna just make a little pitch for Authors Alliance if you haven't heard about us before. Um, you can find some more information here. Membership is free as well. And so if, you'd, if you're an author and you'd like to uh, kind of join in this effort, I encourage you to um, click on that link. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave, that, that's excellent. Um, so I, I can see that there's one question in the chat, but I think that's probably actually quite a, a, a general one. Um, relating to the degree to which a lot of these these questions, these possibilities around, um, especially secure digital lending, but e-lending in general focus. And in fact, no, I think we can cut, tackle this one now and to the degree to which new models negate the possibilities for libraries to actually lend things out because libraries don't own books in the first place. Um, I, don't know, I suppose there's a key question in there about the inevitability of that, or at, at least you know, the idea that, that licensing, I, mean, I don't think anyone's denying licensing as a concept. I don't think that that's not realistic, but it's more denying certain ways in which licensing tends to work. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's, uh, that ownership issue is actually uh, probably the most critical um, one. I do think it's really important that libraries actually have ownership of content. Um, and licensing is a fantastic model. And sometimes, you know, libraries can actually achieve better access for users when they license. Um, I, I used to be a librarian and I would see these deals uh, where they'd come in and they'd say, we'll license you a book and you can let anyone on your campus access it simultaneously. I could, I could have had 30,000 people looking at the same book at the same time and it would have been fine. And that's fantastic. You can do licenses like that. But um, that is, uh, that's a, a great way of achieving uh, sort of short term um, access that goes beyond uh, kind of the ordinary model. But the ordinary model has served us extremely well. And I think that part of that has included ownership um, at the library institution level. Um, and without that, I think you have a whole cascade of challenges downstream. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to think about um, what preservation looks like in 50 or 75 years when a library 
is trying to manage a contract that was signed by people who have been dead for 50 years, right? And can't be located. And it's just, it, it's it's a thicket, it's a mess. I mean, yeah, I, I think in, in, indeed in the conversation you were having a, a earlier today, the, the, the risk that this actually all poses to some of the pretty fundamental questions about what a library is. I, I think that the point you make is a, a really powerful as one that it's not necessarily a case of choosing here that actually that possibility of ownership and acting and in, in, in the way that libraries have always acted provides a really helpful backstop and then licensing can definitely offer opportunities to do better um, but of course I know to actually turn those licenses into a, a positive sum game it, it takes having that backstop to make sure that there is there's always an incentive to to stay at the table and come up with a solution that really works for people. And that, you know that's something that, that as knowledge rights twenty one we're we're definitely keen to look at. So I, I'm going to get, go on to Ariadna uh, Ariadna Matas Castaval, who is um, joining us from bringing in the perspective of Fesabid, and and also brings an experience of, of working with with um, the extremely wide range of institutions involved in Europeana that. I think in particular in, in this case is bringing us from the, the Spanish perspective on what's working, what's the law allow. So with your Spanish hat on, Ariadna, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Uh, I've got a couple of slides. Um, can you see them well? Yes, that's good. Okay, okay thanks. So um, thank you for giving me some space in, in this webinar to speak about some new research that has been conducted in Spain. I'll be talking about a specific report that was published um, a couple of months ago that is entitled Libraries and Limitations in the Digital Context, Control Digital Lending in Spain. So I'll only be speaking about this particular piece of research and um, I won't be speaking about other types of digital or non-digital lending or other jurisdictions. However, I have to say that the study contains a lot of very useful information about how to bring EU law and EU case law into a national context. So the study might be useful for people in other jurisdictions as well. Um, the study was conducted in Spanish, but uh, an English translation was made available recently. So uh, I'll, I'll, we'll try to put the links uh, in the chat and, and you can access them and, and take a look. And if you ever have questions about Spanish exceptions and limitations for libraries and archives and museums, the analysis is really, really good and clear. So you can take that as a like a kind of a reference point. So the study was actually conducted by Professor Raquel Salaverde. She's a professor um, in, in law at the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. She's really um, renowned, has published um, enormously, especially in the area of exceptions and limitations that support research and education. So for us, it has been really interesting to have her views, her take on control, uh, security digital lending specifically. Um, so it's great to have a study conducted by her because we really trust her, her point of view. The study has been organized and commissioned by FESTADIT, which is the Spanish Library Association. And in particular, it was the initiative of Festavit's copyright group, which is composed of some great professionals that are listed in this in this slide. Um, I'm part of this group, and I'll be speaking on behalf of them uh, when presenting this paper and on behalf of Professor Salabarde. If there's any questions I cannot answer, then I can definitely pass them on to my colleagues and to Professor Salabarde. In any case, thanks uh, a lot as well to Knowledge Rights 21 who funded the um, research and made it possible. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about the background of why we decided we needed to, to get a, a couple of answers in that area. And then I'll tell you what the analysis says, uh, the structure that it follows and the results, uh, the conclusions that it reaches. Um, so back in 2016, there was a, a decision from the Court of Justice of the European Union in the context of a Dutch case and a preliminary question that reached the, the Court of Justice. The answer to that question, um, very, very simply put, was that it was possible for a library to rely on the exceptions that it has in its country for lending, um, to lend a digital copy of a book uh, obtained from a legal source. So that kind of, given that the exceptions to copyright for lending had mostly been focused on the notion of tangible objects, this 
decision opened up kind of um, a, a space to try to um, legally lend digital copies of books. And they're uh, something that had been confirmed by the highest court um, in that area in the EU. Um, however, well, many institutions have been promoting the, the fact that this solution existed and uh, encouraging libraries to explore using that solution as a complement to its uh, obtention of licenses or its lending of physical copies. So it's definitely worth, um, worth exploring as something that can really complement and expand the options that the library can deliver in the area of lending. However, we had not seen anyone, any library in Spain make use of that option ever since the, the decision was published. Um, and it's perhaps not very widely used in other countries either. In any case, we were not aware of any library in Spain making use of that solution. Um, the question was why, and even though we don't really have an exact answer to that question, we suspected that it was other than perhaps a lack of awareness. Also, uh, be because we know that is a sector that is particularly risk averse to copyright infringement, it could have been that um, libraries were refraining from using that system because of um, a sufficiently strong legal certainty that it was possible. And maybe one, two, three libraries using it would encourage other libraries to feel that it's safe to do so. Um, and Fesavit can probably have a role in encouraging that. But before we um, went all into that option, we wanted to have a little bit of safe research that confirmed that we could comfortably encourage libraries to, to explore this option. So that's why we decided to commission this, this research. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the reasoning that the research goes through in order to reach the conclusion that, in principle, it's possible to conduct uh, secure digital lending in Spain. Um, and I, well, I hope I'm uh, voicing correctly what is written in the research. If there's any doubt, go back to that paper and that's the correct answer. And, <laughs> but, well, I think I am. Um, so one of the things that the report does is look into the Spanish Copyright Code and see if we have the necessary exceptions to ensure that um, secure digital lending is possible on the basis of the reasoning that the Court of Justice of the European Union conducted. So we do have exceptions for preservation. Um, they We now have actually, unfortunately, two exceptions for preservation, one that we had before the transposition of the copyright directive, and a second one with the transposition of the directive. Our lawmaker better, did a very bad job, and instead of transposing by modifying the main copyright code, we now have two parallel pieces of law regulating the same type of activity. So it's slightly confusing, but what we know is in general that our um, possibility to make copies for preservation purposes should be limited to preservation purposes, and it should be made out of the materials that sit in the permanent collection of the cultural heritage institution. We also have a lending exception that up until now was really strongly linked to the notion of tangible copies. So our impression was that we could lend books that um, were uh, physically in the collections of cultural heritage institutions um, on the basis of the lending exception, not on the basis of a license, um, because it's an exception to the right of distribution, which explicitly refers to the notion of tangible copies. And it's an exception that is remunerated through collective management organizations, specifically through a CMO called uh, CEDRO, which is in charge of reprographic rights. And last, the study also looks into our exception for dedicated terminals, which is the provision that enables giving access to cultural heritage materials from the institution through, um, uh, through terminals located in the institution. This is not crucial for the security uh, digital lending analysis, but the study is really interesting because it kind of uses the opportunity to go look at the state of play of our um, some of our library exceptions. So um, what is super interesting is that then the study kind of goes out, zooms out, and throughout the, um, the piece of research, it, it looks very much into what the EU says through its directive and through the way the Court of Justice of the European Union has been reasoning throughout various relevant uh, cases. So it pays a lot of attention to the most central case in the area of secure digital lending, which is the decision from 2016 
um, from the, well, in the Dutch case, the, that I will call the VOB case, and uh, that I just referred to. But then it also looks into the um, another decision from 2014 uh, involving the uh, university in Darmstadt in Germany, uh, through which the court uh, ruled that in that specific context, it was okay to rely on making copies under an exception for digitization for preservation purposes in order to give access to these copies through dedicated terminals on the basis of yet another exception. Even though uh, these are separate exceptions that serve separate purposes, it was possible to use one as the basis to facilitate the, the service that the other one enables. Um, and then the study also looks into some relevant directives, the InfoSoc directive from 2001, because it has the reference to the distribution right, which is the one that lending is an exception to. It does look at the rental and lending directive from 2006, which is um, analyzed in depth in the first case listed in this slide, and at the copyright directive from 2019, especially because of the preservation exception. So um, on that basis, it kind of, maybe not directly, but to some extent, it, it makes connections between what we have in our Spanish uh, copyright code and what the Court of Justice of the European Union has been um, analyzing and, and deciding. So, for example, it kind of hints at the idea that because we do have a preservation exception, if we look back at how the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, decided things in the Darmstadt case in 2014, we could probably safely use the possibility to make ex um, copies for preservation purposes, digital copies, that we would then uh, uh, well, use in combination with other exceptions. And it looks back at our lending exception and in connection with the VOB case, it kind of clarifies that we probably also have the basis to uh, interpret it the way the Court of Justice did and consider that digital is within its scope. So on that basis, um, one should think that we have what is needed to be able to um, conduct secure digital lending. The, the biggest question, and I think here's where the study is particularly interesting, is that it, it goes into detail in trying to understand what happens when EU law says one thing and our national law is not yet using exactly the same term terminology. Um, and the point of view of Professor Salavarde is that um, it should be understood that the CGEU has competence for aut autonomously defining concepts that are particular to EU law. Um, and even though the acceptance of these concepts back into national law uh, takes very different shapes and forms depending on the country that we're talking about, Spanish um, courts have had a tendency to often refer back to the way the Court of Justice of the European Union resonates and the conclusions that it reaches. So the expectation is that in, in Spain, on the basis of the exceptions we have and on the basis of what the CGEU has been deciding, if there was to be a case, we can be confident to think that the, our courts would interpret things the same way as the Court of Justice of the European Union did. Um, and the study also reminds us of the criteria that the Court of Justice of the EU uses, and she kind of connects this back to how we should be interpreting our own exceptions in a way that is um, restrictive in line with the three-step test, but at the same time, in a way that preserves the intention of the exception, that provides fair balance, etc. So um, the idea is basically that building upon all of this, even though Professor Chalabarde doesn't say exactly, go for it, you can do secure digital lending with no worries, um, I think it's now for the Library Association to decide what we do on that basis. But the report seems to hint at the idea that if anything was to happen, we would be safe and we would have sufficient, sufficiently a legal basis to conduct secure digital lending. Um, the, some of the ideas I think that should be retained though is that um, in, in principle, because of the new preservation exception, it should probably be on the basis of copies being made of what's in the permanent collection of the cultural heritage institution. It should follow the model of one copy, one user, like the Court of Justice uh, described in the VOB case. And it should be subject to remuneration by uh, collective management organizations because we have a lending exception that is subject to remuneration. 
So that's basically the idea that the uh, research hints towards. And of course, um, well, it's a for the library association to make to reach its own conclusions. Um, there's another very interesting point that Professor Salabarde keeps bringing back throughout the study, both in the introduction and towards the conclusions, and that is very much in line with what uh, Stephen and Dave were saying just now. Um, he points out the idea that in order to be able to have constructive conversations in that area, we should be seeing licenses and exceptions as co complementary, and that this possibility of secure digital lending shouldn't be perceived as, as a threat to licensed markets. So, um, Professor Shalaverde explains licensed markets have a place in exploitation in exploiting cultural content, um, and they should never be perceived as a threat. Uh, exceptions should never be perceived as a threat to licensed markets. Just the fact that the three-step test is included in our case in most exceptions as a reference point means that the license cannot be uh, a threat in itself. Uh, the exception cannot be a threat to licensed markets. So they should be seen as an opportunity to complement each other and for exceptions to make up for whatever market deficiencies there, uh, that there might be. Um, and last, she reminds us of the fact that exceptions are really essential to safeguard certain public interest activities and bring balance back to the copyright system. So um, th this is basically what the study says. And at the very end, uh, Professor Chalaverde makes a couple of recommendations Acknowledging that it's not like we have 100% um, legal certainty, she does make a couple of recommendations to explain what should happen now to make sure that we can comfortably make use of the option that the CGU unlocked for us. So um, she recognizes that an eventual court case would definitely bring a lot of legal certainty without uh, without encouraging uh, to taking that type of action. But she does say that um, EU law and EU case law will eventually permeate through court cases into Spanish into the Spanish legal system. Uh, until that happens, she suggests that a couple of changes are made to our copyright law. Um, one of them is making a better transposition of Article 6 of the Copyright Directive, which brings in this new preservation exception. Among other things, it has been transposed without the safeguards um, that over uh, TPMs and contract can be overridden. So it's a it's a really bad and rushed uh, transposition and having two separate articles is also very confusing. She then um, encourages the lawmaker to explicitly include that control digital lending is possible in line with the VOB case as part of our lending exception. And she also recommends explicitly mention the, mentioning the possibility to combining uh, to combine exceptions in certain cases. Um, other than that, she suggests that guidelines and good practice is something that um, probably the Library Association could take up to, to facilitate um, making use of such a practice. Um, and last, it would be interesting to start talking to collective management organizations to discuss what the remuneration for um, for securities that lending could look like, given that we should assume that it's subject to remuneration, but we don't know to what extent it should follow the same um, the same criteria as the remuneration we have for physical lending. Um, so that's it, and uh, I hope <laughs> that was useful. And I'll, I'll drop the links to the studies. Thank you very much. That's great, Ariadna. Thank you so much, and that that was super super clear. And I think sort of setting out in that way. In particular, I think what we understand, Dave mentioned secure digital lending, you, you went in, into more depth. And to be honest, actually, quite how unambitious it, it, it arguably feels. And I think that, that point that you made there, Ariadna, was really powerful that there are countless situations where the market is not providing access to something. Um, rare works, works held in very specific, in very specific places works where otherwise simply the, the possibility of access would be super limited and where something like secure digital lending offers a, a pretty fair way of providing access while also providing a, a benefit to the author while at the same time absolutely not being at all workable as a way of replacing what markets are doing and what licensing is doing and so that emphasis on, on, on complementarity is, 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 is powerful and hopefully well taken I think also you underlined some really interesting points there about the, you know, firstly, the value of what FESABID's doing by coming together and looking to commission legal advice. And I think I know 
we are in a world where unfortunately there is a, a greater fear of of breaking licensing terms or being sued than there is of not actually fulfilling the missions of libraries to provide access to information to all. Um, and so working together is a better way of actually I know, responding to that first fear and actually at the same time dealing much better with the second by coming to solutions, but clearly the role of government in providing that backstop is, is crucially important. Um, I can see there's a one question in, in, in the, the couple of questions in the chat, in fact, so um, there's one from Martin asking about whether university libraries can would, would be covered by um, what, what's been talked about in the study. Um, there's a question from Piyor um, saying and, uh, how imminent is a court case in, 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 in Spain to test this out? I guess a lot depends on how courts in Spain actually work. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the question uh, about the court case. I, I'm i kind of just passing the message on what's in the report and I wouldn't dare to um, uh, speak on behalf of uh, Fistavit, but may, I mean, it's an option worth considering, um, I guess. Um, all right. I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, yeah. It's probably as much as you can answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the question about academic libraries. Uh, yeah, I need to double check. I, I cannot remember now by heart if academic libraries are excluded from the. Um, um, let let me double check. But I think, um, yeah, I, I assume uh, if as long as they benefit from the same exceptions, they could probably also uh, be considered as benefiting from that. Yeah, so uh, do, do, do then, uh, you, you can answer that one in the chat. I know that in some of the work that, that w w we've been looking at and, and, and looking to commission, there's the idea that well, where there is a lending right in general, there is the potential for secure digital lending. But OK, I, I'll, I'll head on to, to, to Matthias to, to get the, the viewpoint from Germany, where you know, Germany is a, a fascinating case that it's right up there in the coalition agreement. But I don't know at the risk of falling into stereotypes of and delivery of commitments is always a big question. So with it, so um, Matthias from uh, Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte. Matthias, over to you. No, we can't yet hear you, Matthias. Oh, if you're speaking. I have to okay. unmute myself. Can you hear we, me? We can now. Go for it. Great. Can you see the slide? Yes. Yeah. Great. So thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Matthias Schindler. I work at uh, Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte in Berlin. We are a uh, civil society organization that is mostly focusing on strategic litigation, um, enforcing civil and human rights. I've been working here at GFF um, on topics of copyright um, and working as an uh, investigative researcher for three years now. That includes filing freedom of information requests and now um, thankfully working on the topic of uh, e-lending um, with various partners. Um, GFF is also uh, a member of uh, Comunia and uh, we have uh, ties to organizations such as Wikimedia uh, on topics of um, open knowledge and open content. Um, just a crash course, this is not going to be a civics course, but Germany is a federal republic. Um, so there are 16 states and there is a, a devolution of responsibilities, matters of uh, culture and media are on the state level. Um, whereas copyright um, is on the federal level. And of course, copyright is one of the topics that is highly influenced by EU legislation. Um, the public libraries, to a large extent, are um, funded and, and uh, run by municipalities. Um, this is uh, the, the background in which all debates happen because all the discussions on uh, running libraries usually involve various layers of government um, and, and finance. Um, 
on the federal level, uh, there is a four-year legislative term, and the last federal election was in 2021, so it's uh, um, more than 50% of the current legislative term has passed. Uh, there will be um, upcoming elections in, in uh, fall of next year, or they can happen earlier if a government fails, which has happened before. It's not a hypothetical situation, but um, right now it seems to be stable enough. Germany is also a multi-party system um, of currently six or five parties in uh, the German Bundestag. Um, one party, uh, one faction recently split up uh, in two parts, but this is, there's no going into details. The most important part is that the current government is consisting of uh, three parties, which is uh, by German standards, not the use case. Two party coalitions were common, um, single party uh, governments were um uh, happened once or twice, but this time it's a three-party coalition. And the the parties in question, I I put in the um, the European families uh, or the, the the names of the groups in the European Parliament for reference. Um, in in the brackets, they are usually not considered to be natural allies in this combination. It's possible, it has happened before, it's so-called the Ampel Coalition, uh, the, the traffic light collision because it's red, green, and yellow. Um, um, they have formed under the, um, as a result, uh, they have formed after an extensive negotiations resulting in uh, a 144 page coalition agreement. The German term is Koalitionsvertrag, which actually translates into a coalition contract, which is a misnomer because um, it lacks all the properties of a contract. There is no binding power, no self-execution of such uh, a Koalitionsvertrag. This is basically a political statement by three parties on the things they intend to achieve uh, without binding um, powers towards parliament or government. All the promises and um, um, intentions stated in this agreement have to be transposed into a government working plan and then into to law. Um, and then within these 144 pages, there is um, one paragraph on various topics of copyright. Um, in, in various forms. And there is this one line statement, we want fair conditions, uh, framework conditions concerning e-lending in libraries. And this is um, a beautiful example of how uh, government coalitions form because this statement um, is nothing and everything uh, in it together. Um, I can't imagine a person actively asking for unfair conditions. So it is pretty much self-evident that there is consensus on this statement, but then there is a follow-up question. What are fair conditions in terms of e-lending in libraries? Um, and there are currently three um, non-legislative um, actions happening. The uh, Department of Justice, which is in charge of copyright, um, sent out a questionnaire last year um, to all people interested in the topic of copyright on the question of e-lending. Uh, and the first question was, was quite sensible, uh, is do you consider the current conditions fair? And by the way, what do you think is the meaning of fair condition anyway? Um, the questionnaire was, was honest in the sense that it was broadly worded that it had uh, plenty of opportunity for all market participants, uh, libraries, um, um, other people involved in, and uh, companies offering services to bring in their perspective without indicating any kind of road that the ministry tends to, to take away. This is an open question or a set of open questions. Um, then there is currently a, a round table on e-lending happening. This is hosted by the um, 
um, Kulturstaatsministerin, the, the Government Commissioner on Culture and Media. Um, this is a job description attached to the uh, Chancery Office. Um, and this roundtable um, has agreed on, on several questions um, that are being forwarded to a company called the, the Econ, which is now conducting a study uh, on e-lending. Um, I will go into details on each of these three ones. So the questionnaire, um, the deadline was in, in, I think, June or July last year. Um, about 100 or more than 100 participants um, um, sent in uh, their answers. Um, unfortunately, the ministry did not intend or plan for the possibility of releasing these answers on their own. There were a couple of participants who um, released the questions on their own websites, including um, the um, German Library Association, uh, Wikimedia and, and Comunia did so as well. Knowledge Rights, um, best of my knowledge, um, actively released their answers uh, as well. Um, and when I filed a freedom of information request at the end of last year, um, asking for these um, um, answers, the, the ministry retroactively decided to publish the answers, but needed to get permission first. This is an ongoing process. Um, I think give or take 90 answers have been uh, released by now, and we are in the process of um, freedom of information processing the remaining ones. Um, these answers include statements by um, by publishing houses, um, some of them, uh, and also by organizations such, such as the Börsenverein, the organization uh, of publishers and booksellers in Germany. Um, the link contains all current publicly available statements, and there might be some more uh, upcoming, depending on the outcome of the Freedom of Information request. Um, and of course, there seems to be a consensus among the participants uh, on the questions, are the current conditions fair? And uh, to no one's surprise, everyone agrees that the current conditions are not fair. This is the, the one consensus statement by publishers, by authors, by libraries. Um, the reasons for this characterization, they, they differ widely. And uh, to no one's surprise, um, publishers are, um, to, to a large share, denying the need for e-lending in the first place. Um, they see sufficient, um, they, they, they consider that licenses um, are sufficient. Um, in any case, the market seems to be working. And if anything, there should only be put in more money into the um the, the money for for acquiring more content. Um, but there is a, a vocal opposition towards any kind of legal requirement um, promoting pushing towards um, uh, e-lending in, in any in any way shape or form. Um, the round table, which I'm not part of, um, there I think some of the participants today are um, representing organizations that are uh, in this round table. Um, this is basically the, the equivalent of a German proverb that's saying, uh, wenn du nicht mehr weiter weißt, gründe einen Arbeitskreis, meaning if you don't know how to proceed, um, let's find a working, let's found a working group. Um, this is the, the idea is to start a conversation, to, to kickstart it or to to bring people together who seem not to are, are currently not very much inclined to talk in the first place. Publishers and libraries. Um, I, I was there was some someone um, with who, whom, whom I can't mention for privacy reasons who said that this roundtable has already succeeded because now the, these people are talking again with each other, which either which they didn't before. Um, I don't expect. Um, any specific results from this roundtable alone, apart from um, a reiteration and sharpening of the arguments in favor and, and against e-lending. 
but I'm willing to be pleasantly surprised. However, this roundtable uh, managed to um, to agree on a series of questions that are now forwarded to um, the recipient of a contract uh, of a consulting group called the EV Econ, which is now conducting the, the study on certain questions of e-lending. Um, this study is heavily focused on financial aspects, and it's also focused on public libraries. Um, best of my knowledge, there is no mentioning and no um, focus and attention given to scientific libraries um, at all. Uh, and the, the reasoning or the argument in favor of e-lending doesn't seem to apply here as well. It's basically only trying to figure out um, the displacement rates and the economic impact uh, of e-lending models to the perceived primary market of book selling and book licensing um, between libraries, uh, between publishers and uh, their, their target audiences. The results are expected this year. The, the results were also expected a bit earlier already. Um, there have been some delays. Um, I would be very much happy to get any information on being able to more pinpoint the the timetable for this result but um, the effect of this study not being conducted um, is significant in a sense that it um, it prevents anyone else from doing something so most um, participants in the current ecosystem um, including the the copyright um, spokespeople on uh, in, in government parties um, basically say let's let's wait for the study results first and then see uh, if something has to happen um, so yeah that's something that needs to be considered um, and of course given the, the, the question and the, the the scope of this question this the study um, not all the answers can be expected from from such a study um, on making the case uh, in favor um, of, of the various e-lending models and legal requirements um, for libraries. Um, Wikimedia, uh, Frag den Staat, a couple of other um, non-government organizations are currently uh, working, um, maintaining a, something called a coalition progress tracker, which is basically a civil society effort to to track the progress of this coalition, coalition government. Um, so if you are interested in any further progress, uh, you can um, look at the, the, the tracker, it's in German, um, and see um, our efforts to, um, to quantify and to monitor um, these, um, um, these coalition agreement uh, projects. Um, it is my personal impression that e-lending within the realm of copyright right now does not get the amount of, of attention um, in the public and in the political sphere that it, it should get. Um, and there is a distinct lack of organizations um, in the in the style of, of uh, Dave Hansen's organization representing office interests rather than interests of people speaking on behalf of authors, but strangely mirroring um, publishers' points of views, um, so to speak. Um, so if anyone is willing and, and able to clone Dave Hansen and um, and bring him to, uh, him to Germany, um, this would be highly appreciated. Um, Dave, you're always welcome in Germany. Um, um, we're, we're counting on you. <laughs> um, this is the obligatory slide uh, requesting donations and, and participation for Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte. Um, and um, I'm happy to share the links in the uh, chat for your convenience and for your automatic translation system if needed. Um, thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And I hope I didn't... Um, I didn't be a, I wasn't the kind of a bus kill um after after this uh, tour de force through the German political sphere, uh, sphere. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I love the 
contrast between lawyers bringing joy and political scientists bringing us misery and 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 despair and so on. But I I, I suspect what's interesting in 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 Germany is that you've actually got to the phase of of having these conversations. And I think the point you make about you know, having a, a round table, I think in the UK it was always have a royal commission was the the what you do when you don't want to discuss something and you want to move things forward. I think that there's some interesting, really interesting in points in what you say. I think the politics of this, and I think the degree to which you, you begin to realise that there is quite a lot of fear and concern on the other side of the discussion. I know that in Germany you had to face some pretty hysterical opposition repeatedly to anything that would enable libraries to do their jobs better and, and there were stories of authors being called up on Friday night and told that they had to sign on to this letter and they shouldn't read it first in, in order to campaign against e-lending and I, I know there's been some interesting work done there if I don't you know if you'll be able to talk about it where there was actually an effort to talk to the law authors and try and work out what they understood and I, I will come back to that I think another point you make that that's really interesting here and, and one of the reasons why as knowledge rights 21 we find e-lending a really key issue is it it sort of illustrates the degree to which a shift away from limitations and exceptions and towards licensing is effectively the government stepping away from the field and, and just deregulating um because and if, when you're working through contracts and licensing Private law comes into play. It's it's your market power, your ability to actually get the terms and the possibilities that you want that come into play. So effectively, that does represent a, a, a deregulation. And, and of course, that's nice for the people and, and the organisations who will be able to, 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 to benefit from that. Um, I can see that Dave had a question. I'm actually going to ask a question which will touch both Dave and, and Matthias and then let Dave answer and, and ask. I think that there is a key question about how much authors actually understand of, of of what's going on and i don't know if matthias you can talk to the work that i know has been done trying to understand how much authors are aware of what they're earning from e-lending vis-a-vis physical lending and whether how far they're even aware of their books being lent so i'll hand over to both matthias i'll hand over to you and then dave can answer and then ask his own question I have some anecdotal evidence to suggest that um, many authors are highly appreciative of any kind of remuneration through um, limitations and exceptions. Um, at the same time, um, there is no no credible voice in the in the political sphere willing to fight. For this position um, on their own without strong influence from publishers point of views uh, a couple of years ago there was an um, interesting case about publishers getting some share of remuneration set aside um, to offers uh, the ECJ ruled this um, incompatible to EU law uh, and the DSM directive brought in a fix to reinstate publishers' uh, share in, in this remuneration. Um, and the the interesting part here is that um, the visibility in this political debate where people speaking on behalf of authors asking for this fix, claiming that the better the situation for publishers gets, the better the situation will eventually trickle down to to offers um when in fact this was basically a direct 40 percent pay cut to offers um now being redirected again to to publishers um there has been a tremendous amount of scaremongering uh to a much more visible topic on artificial intelligence uh, generative ai um in the name of authors um i would really appreciate a um a strong credible voice such as authors alliance in germany uh 
next to the the other existing voices of publishers um and i'm sure that there might be overlaps in certain points there might be divergent there might be contradicting uh statements of course um but but right now i don't see this voice um and i don't see um authors being represented um at all in this in this scenario um so uh to to steven's question about awareness i mean i think it varies wildly uh from author to author and there are certain aspects of payments to authors that are easier to understand i think plr um payments actually are an, an understandable part but ebook license uh royalties and how those funds flow to authors um <clears throat> can be something of a black box uh, and that's not to mention other other formats. You know, I think um, uh, when you think about audiobooks, uh, everything gets very, very uh, messy. Um, some of you may remember uh, Spotify um, uh, had a uh, had an issue um, years ago, not even many years ago, just recently, where they were kind of engaged in this sort of trickery where authors' books were. Um, <clears throat> They were paying royalties to authors through that system um, and allowing or kind of encouraging people to read a book, return it. Um, and then when the return happened, the authors were getting no royalties. So Spotify was being paid, but authors were being cut out. No authors knew about this until an, one author, just because of the way the timing worked, had a statement that indicated that she has ne had negative sales of her uh, book as an ebook. And so, so you sometimes have funny uh, accounting practices like that that can make it very difficult um, to, uh, to to keep track of. Um, so the, the, this actually relates to a question I had for um, Matthias that uh, you know authors are not a monolith um, and trade book authors uh, have a very different set of interests and you know frankly a very different set of royalty payments that comes to them versus uh, academic authors. And so I was curious in this whole debate, if you saw much of a differentiation between those different kinds of authors in terms of you know, pressure to get them uh, to, to sign on um, in opposition to, uh, to this or um, to sort of the strategy, because I've seen in other jurisdictions that um, you know, academic authors, I think have a very different perspective on why they write um, and they also get very, very little in the way of royalties. I mean, I, I, most people I talk to say, you know, my royalty statement allowed me to buy a nice lunch last year, uh, and that was kind of it. So they're a lot less interested in, in that aspect of um, the the motivation for their work. You're absolutely right, and and uh, this is this is part of the beauty to have authors not be seen as a monolith because there is diversity. There are um, multiple reasons to write. Some of them might be financial in nature. Might some might be just expressive or part of a of an academic career or a desire to to share and disseminate knowledge as as widely as possible. Um, the German debate in the past has seen some, let's say, special interests, such as um, coalitions of um, screenwriter or um, play, play is it screenwriter, yeah, uh, books. Um, there is the equivalent of a, a TV show called Law and Order. Um, they were um, highly visible, um, even in, on on topics where they themselves were not directly affected by by changes in copyright um scientific offers in general um are used to the idea that it's them or their institutions doing the payment to get uh works uh in 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 print uh through processing fees um one way or another um this is um, of course, highly influential to the debate of open access publishing, um, and and um, and of course, um, there have been, I think, quite sensible debates on on how uh, open access publishing can take part in remuneration schemes on on exceptions and limitations. Of course, um, and this has I, I think there is there are some provisions in 
in EU law, um, making this possible one way or another. Um, but um, um, I, I'm I don't feel qualified to uh, to give a definitive expose on on this landscape. Um, um, I think based on the research available, it would be unfair to assume that um, the majority of authors are currently able to to write for a living uh, with or without um, uh, payments through limitations and exceptions remuneration. So um, there is always some third party footing the bill or making it possible for people to um to work in this greater sphere um and this is sometimes uh a, a public sponsor one way or another or and sometimes it can be a, a private enterprise or self exploitation of course um yeah great so um I'm go uh, I wanted to go back to a, a question that Mache asked uh, earlier, and I know it's specifically focused on on Germany, but I think it's actually relevant for all of our speakers. So Ariadne in Spain, Matthias in Germany, and Dave with the US, and I don't know feel free to talk to Canada if you want to as well about um I don't know as is from, from one perspective, uh, how is the current offer actually working? Are the librarians happy? And I suppose actually linked to that, um, the fact that you're on this call probably pre uh, supposes what the answer to that question is. Um, what is it that actually sort of triggered libraries, other organizations to actually start looking at this as an issue and thinking, this isn't right, we've got to do something about it. Um, Dave, do you want to talk to the, the US case? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I think in the U.S. The, and, and Canada, the story is one that's been building for the last uh, 20 plus years. And there have been a number of sort of false starts uh, for providing access. So, um, you know, there's there's been book digitization um, for a long time and there's been efforts uh, across libraries in the U.S. going back probably 20, 25 years. Uh, to try to address this issue. Um, and uh, I, I see that as kind of coming to a head in the last few years with uh, efforts to um, promote uh, uh, to, to promote controlled digital lending, um, to promote fair licensing practices. Uh, in fact, there's a whole organization in the US called Library Futures uh, that was basically spun up um, in the last few years to address these issues. Um, it's like their, their core platform. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, the short answer is no, there's not a lot of happiness with the current system, at least on that side of things. Um, and I don't think authors are particularly happy with the system either. I think the only people who are happy with the system are the, the major commercial publishers, um, even the smaller publishers, you know, I deal a lot with university presses and small independent presses, and they're not happy with it either. Um, because, uh, you know, in order to enter um, the licensing system that exists, you have to be on certain platforms and you have to have certain terms. And so there's this sort of allure of being a, you know, large conglomerate, um, which is basically what the big five publishers and the big four academic publishers are. Um, and so, uh, so I think that that's um, uh, a real challenge in how we got to the point that we are today. Um, you know, I think the other piece of it that um, I've seen over the last few years is uh, a a divergence in an understanding of uh, or a kind of collective understanding of what copyright law is supposed to do in the U.S. and kind of in Canada too. Um, and I think the COVID pandemic sort of brought that to the floor, where you know you had so many people who are locked at home and they could not get access. And it just seemed totally at odds with the idea of promoting learning and promoting um, the progress of, of science. Um, and so you had 
all of these groups, kind of libraries and related organizations on the one side say, you know, we need to do this because um, all of our other traditional access models have ceased to exist, at least temporarily, and a, a sort of intransigence on the other side uh, uh, and a disagreement about kind of the fundamentals of what this system is supposed to do. So, um, you know, there's tension. Uh, I, I found it amusing that the conversation about, you know, royal commissions or round tables, um, it's a much more civilized approach than what we do in the US, which is just sue each other. Uh, so um, <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd kind of prefer to have a round table over some of what happens here. <laughs> you, you probably get to a you probably get to a solution quicker some of the time. <laughs> but uh, Ariadna, so the case in Spain. Um, yeah, I was going to say, um, in terms of lending, Spanish libraries resisted for a very long time to to pay the um, or a public lending right for physical lending. So there was a, a huge dissatisfaction for a long time around this. There were court cases, blah, blah. And um, now it's like we're still grappling with that side of the picture. I think now some uh, things are being reorganized so that the payment comes from the regions instead from a lower administrative level. And some regions have started paying, but um, all of the payments are not being. Um, uh, so there's like some civil disobedience uh, from libraries going on on, on that front. Um, when it comes to digital lending through licenses, I am not familiar with um, current uh, challenges or like I, I'm, I don't have information around whether there's a dissatisfaction with the licensing conditions that libraries are getting. There's a national platform and two regional platforms that seem to be working fine, but um, there, might, there might be issues with the selection of titles and the licensing conditions that I'm, that I'm not familiar with. When it comes to secure digital lending, so far, I don't know of any library using it. And I think we need to try to explain how uh, the, the purpose that it can serve, like the gap that it can fill, so that librarians understand that it complements some other uh, situations and they prepare their work to, to adapt to that possibility as well. Because right now, I guess people are organized going ahead with the impression that that's not even possible. So they're covering things with other options. Um, so yeah, well, that would be my uh, two cents. No, I, th I, th and I think that makes sense. I'm, I'm constant in Spain, obviously, that the c c concern was that the lower down the chain the money is paid from, basically, the more the money just comes out of library acquisition budgets in, in the first place. So all that public lending right in that case achieves is it doesn't mean any more money for authors. It just means fewer books available, which doesn't really seem to be consistent with the overall goal here. But I, I'm constantly, I think, as, as you said precisely, that, that one of the points of creating the study was to raise awareness of this as one part of a, a holistic sort of library offer. Um, Matthias, can you speak as, I'm just going to link into that, I don't know, that what triggered this in the first place in Germany. And actually one thing that I, I, I mentioned I, so I, I wrote down that you mentioned was we talk often about the economic impact, although a lot of the time the economic impact is purely seen from one side of the equation uh, and there is a benefit and maybe it's a social benefit, maybe it's a, a, a t hard to monetize benefit that comes from lending in terms of providing that access and allowing people to become researchers and educators and, and, and build their skills in the future. But what, what was it that sort of triggered that getting this into the coalition agreement in Germany. So, okay, there, there are two aspects to your question. The, the, the second one is, is easier to answer. The, um, this statement on fair conditions is most likely the result of various competing proposals for a statement mashed together until they lacked any kind of controversy among the three parties forming an agreement. Um, the Liberal Party had in the past, when they were in, in opposition, proposed in the German Bundestag um, e-lending rights. The um, Bundesrat, which is the, let's say, upper house in Germany representing uh, states' interests, 
had in the past several times insisted on uh, extending lending rights to electronic publications and was turned down by um, the Bundestag and uh, their proposals were not picked up. So in various constellations, there was a, a request to make some sort of statement. Um, and this is most likely the, the compromise wording that um, that works as an umbrella term to all the competing in, uh, proposals right now in terms of uh, making it a lending right versus making licensings compulsory, for example, any kind of sort of in between um, that could happen in the future. And um, on the situation for, for librarians in Germany, the 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 responses um given to the ministry of justice are full of um sometimes rather compassionate and, and passionate uh statements from li librarians who who say that in the current conditions they are unable to fulfill the the um access needs of their patrons uh to provide content because of windowing clauses because of the inability of some publishers to even provide electronic versions of uh, some books. Um, and um, this might also coincide to the changing nature of libraries in the first place. Um, libraries had um, in the past a strong connection to being a physical place uh, one way or another, and, and distance lending or interlibrary loans were existed for a long time. They but they were not not the, the dominating uh, uh, path for for public libraries, and um, libraries see themselves in 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 a currently in a position where they can redefine their role um, as as guardians and stewards to provide access to content, whether it's available only in the library or somewhere else, um, media literacy, um, teaching to some extent, providing opportunities is a um, is an increasing factor in the the the, the sales proposition of, of a library. Um, there are a couple of libraries in Berlin um, offering not just 3D printing or 3D scanning tools, but also um, basically IT services telling people how to fill out um, um, applications to, to government services uh, for people who have under trouble understanding this. Um, and e-lending is, I think, one big part in this puzzle of being in a position where libraries can help and provide services to uh, to people in whatever form they need, without without special needs in in terms of accessibility, um, mobility, for example, and and so on. Uh, and this is, I think, this is a extremely convincing reason why they are so so frustrated in in this in this current condition, because they want to help and they are not allowed to help. Um, and this is not in the interest of any author, publisher, um, because the, the, the information need goes unsatisfied. Um, it's as simple as that. Um, I, th I think it, it, it again, it's a point we often make as Knowledge Rights 21 is that is copyright really the right lens to look at these questions through? Is that the right end of the telescope? We've only got a couple of minutes left. So I, I'm going to hand over to each of our speakers for a few final words. I'm going to start with Dave. I, I know it's been mentioned in the chat, but and, and the offer to, to engage in, in Authors Alliance is, is there. So, Dave? Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, I just wanted to conclude with um, uh, an invitation for folks on the call uh, to join. I'll put the link in the chat here. And I think, you know, the, the um, one of the big gaps that Matthias identified and I think exists across a number of jurisdictions is that the people who are speaking on behalf of authors don't speak on behalf of all authors. And there is a strong perception that um, there is in, in public policy debates that uh, authors are somehow at odds with the interests of libraries in lending uh, through more reasonable um, e-lending uh, legislation or um, interpretations of the law. 
And uh, so it's extremely valuable, I think, for folks to join, you know, either yourselves or, you know, if you know of authors who have a strong interest in the um, in, in the public good and want to see things like this happen, you know, send the link. It's free. Um, and I think it does really make a difference and add some credibility uh, for us to be able to speak on behalf of European authors. I, um, I would love to be cloned um, and, uh, and, and have a clone of me somewhere in Germany. Um, I cannot figure out how to do that, but I am confident that there are authors in Germany who hold the same views um, and who are articulate and uh, who can express these things in a way that will be um, probably even more persuasive uh, than me um, in that context. And so I just want to encourage folks to, to join and to spread the word about um, getting others to as well. Great, thank you. Um, Ariadna, final words, takeaways, things that you'd encourage others on the call to do? Um, not so sure about an encouragement, um, but just, well, some of the things that resonated from what I heard is, the, um, I know the, the image you gave Matthias didn't seem very promising, but I think it's having people talk to each other is already a great situation because in case of need, you have a forum to go to uh, where you can maybe bring some proposal. Not sure that it unlocks a solution, but that's already relatively encouraging. And um, I hope we can maybe get to a point where we can have all stakeholders talk to each other a bit more in Spain, particularly the government that has been missing in action <laughs> in the past years and avoiding any contact with the library sector, which is really, really problematic. Thank you. And definitely a powerful one. Again, this is one of the risks with looking at everything from a copyright perspective. It's always, it's very zero sum game. And, and, and other perspectives offer, often from research or education or whatever, offer a more constructive way of looking at things. Matthias. Uh, final words. Um, I I hope to see most of you, all of you, again in in one way or another, keeping uh, keep on the fight. Um, but the the one thing that is relevant for me is is that there needs to be um, a a an explanation why this is important and the copyright details follow but it, and and in this case there is um civil society and society as a whole is currently under so much pressure from disinformation and and forces trying to 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 split and to tear apart society that libraries are in the most beautiful opportunity and position to to work as a um a kid to keep society together to to keep a, a to to help um keep this conversation alive to 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 promote the idea of making informed decisions um and so on um and once once you start from this position then you can suggest changes and adaptations to copyright to fulfill this goal. Um, I do have some hope um, that the German government will eventually um, improve things, but I have slightly more hope that there can be an European conversation um, at around the European elections this year or slightly afterwards um, on, on improvements um, on the EU level that um, could help libraries, authors, uh, and the public um, equally. Thank you. Thank you. you. You've done a very good job of, of, of doing my job there. But I think that that call to you know, accept that you know, copyright is a tool and you know, it's not an end. An end is a, a healthy, um, a, he a healthy literature sector, a healthy science sector, a healthy education sector, and remembering what we're actually going for rather than obsessing about the tool is is, is pretty crucial. So um, with that, I, I, I want to say thank you um, hugely to, to Dave, to Ariadna, to, to Matthias, that we've obviously been recording this and, and we will share the recording. Um, I want to 
just end just by saying a couple of things. So first of all, um, thanks to the Arcadia Fund who make all of this work possible um, through their support for Knowledge Rights 21. Um, that makes a, a, a big difference here. Um, I'd encourage everyone um look at the links in the chat. I'm just going to add a couple in there, which I will um, refer to as well. Please do keep following Knowledge Rights 21. I think certainly that's something we're looking to, to do at the European, at the national level, make sure that those rules about not just about copyright, but around information, legislation, and regulation in general, actually serve goals rather than tools. Um, uh, and that's something, something we're certainly sort of looking to do. Um, I'd encourage in particular, do take a look at the ebook pledge and in particular, the um, model addendum that's included in there that sets out suggested provisions that should be part of, of, of ebook contracts that don't fundamentally unbalance anything, but do safeguard some of those fundamental aspects of library activities, allow libraries to be libraries. Um, I'd encourage people to look at our list of um, national coordinators. Um, the link is also in there and get, get in touch if you're interested in getting involved. Certainly, we would hope and the whole idea throughout this is said it's not about denying licensing. That just doesn't make sense. It's making sure that we're just in a situation where libraries can be libraries, where libraries can fulfill that really vital societal mission and therefore fulfill those rights to education to culture and to knowledge so with that um thank you everyone we will get the recording up as soon as possible and otherwise i wish you a very good afternoon and pretty soon weekend so thank you very much everyone